so we keep him a little bit busy. Brian Hughes is next to Connie there. And Brian is the staff director on the Energy Committee. He is from Anchorage, doing a great job for me. Uh, he walks in, we pass Anwar, and all is good. Uh, <laughs> but he couldn't have done that without the exceptional help of Annie Heffler. Annie is also from Anchorage, and she is one of my rising stars on the Energy and Natural Resources Committee. So uh, I thank them for what they do. I want to acknowledge, though, an individual who is not part of that lineup, and I begged him to come. Some of you will remember uh, Chuck LaSchulte from the days that he worked here in Juneau as a reporter. Some of you uh, have had dealings with him on constituent issues over the past 27 years years. Chuck Klesholte is probably the greatest font of Alaska wisdom, political history, legislative uh, intent and background that you will ever find. After 27 years, he told me, I'm, I'm buying a little farm and I'm going to go paint my barn and have a life. Uh, He's made a mistake already because he's given me his cell number. <laughs> and I intend to use it because he is better than any Google app or Wikipedia than I will ever find. And, and what Chuck LaShelty has, has done in helping us advance Alaska's efforts, I think that deserves a round of applause to my friend Chuck. So know that we're all here to work with you and, and, and your teams. Uh, give us a call. You know how to get a hold of us. Send us, a, send us an email. But I think we know our challenges are real. They are daunting. Uh, but they're not things that we can hide from. Nobody expects us to do that. They expect us to, to work together to overcome them. Um, but again, find the good. Let's, let's recognize that our opportunities in this state are immense. And, and we have to work together to, to not only protect them, but to advance them. This is, this is an extraordinary place that we are blessed to call home. We're blessed to be citizens of, of the greatest state in this amazing nation. And I'm blessed to be here with you all. So thank you. And now we'll take questions. Thank you. Senator Olson, where are you? You have a question. There you are. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator uh, Murkowski, we want to thank you for all the work that you've done, and especially during this productive year, realizing that the senator from Bethel and myself have been here for a number of years, and we've watched the attempts over the years that have been unsuccessful, and then finally we were able to see the 1002 lands in my area opened up, and thanks to you for, for my constituents as well. The question I have for you today has to do with the um, graphite deposit you've already talked about there in my district up there northwest of Teller in that area. And currently I'm working on a bill to go ahead and try and facilitate that so that the uh, deposit can be uh, made to enhance the people's l lifestyle and level of living up there. Uh, Alaska has obviously one of the largest graphite deposits that are in the world and that currently we are 100% dependent upon China for those. Uh, you've talked about Bokan in those areas. Um, but my, my question for you has to do with what specifically is happening in Washington under, with your efforts to try and make this so that indeed it comes a reality within a shorter period of time and not uh, gets bogged down in some of the bureaucracy as well as the uh, challenges that may be out there from people that don't necessarily want that to happen. Well, Senator Olson, thank you. Thank you for the question, but thank you for your leadership on this. Uh, again, I think it's exciting what we have with our mineral potential uh, around the state. And we've, we have been here, particularly look at our, our region down here with, with, with Greens Creek, Kensington. Uh, these mining jobs are not only uh, good career jobs, but good for the region and, and producing a resource that the country needs. When you mention graphite, our reality is, is, is graphite has been identified as one of those critical minerals that we are 100% reliant on outside sources, China or others, for. You know, when you think about, think about where we were 
15 years ago. We were talking about our vulnerability as a nation on other countries who we didn't like and they didn't like us, but we needed their oil. It was about a not quite 70% reliant on, on, on foreign sources, but it was right up there. That was not a good place to be from a security perspective, whether national security or, or energy security. We turned the tide on that. We have turned the tide on that in, a, in an exciting and a dramatic way. It's been one of those energy upheavals that they're going to be writing about in, in history books and what is happening in the United States. But at the, at the same time that we focused on doing better when it comes to our oil and gas potential, we've just kind of turned a blind eye to that other vulnerability, which is our minerals. We can't do anything without the minerals that allow us to, to be a, a competitive country. I mentioned the great prospects that we have within the renewable energy sector. If we want to put more wind turbines up, I'm sorry, you have to coat the, uh, the blades with, with some of these critical minerals that are not being, not being mined here in this country. So we've got a We've got a bill, our critical minerals piece, that we have been advancing uh, through the legislative process and have great support for that. It identifies and, uh, and provides for not only an inventory, but then how do we do more to, to allow access to these very important resources. The Department of Interior just issued last week, in fact, um, it might have even been at the first of this week, the, the, the list that we had requested of identification of these critical minerals, there's 35 now, that are important to everything from automobile manufacturing to make sure that your, your smartphone works to, uh, to, to you know, your, your lithium ion batteries, everything that, uh, that we rely on in so many different everyday applications. So we're, we've been working with the administration on how to highlight this in a way that's going to make a difference for us. So Graphite, Graphite One's project is really exciting up there because we need Graphite in so many different applications. And we have it in, in a, uh, uh, I guess, an intensity or purity, I guess, is what I'm looking for that is, is quite exciting. And then think about, think about the opportunity. It's not just extracting it. Let's not be just the extractive state. Let's process it here. And we know we've got opportunities, whether it's down in Ketchikan, whether it's in Seward, whether it is in, you know, we could, we could develop new areas for, for placement of, of this processing. But let's Let's bring all of these jobs and make them happen here at home. So it's exciting, and I think it's, it's a positive factor that we have an administration that is really keenly focused on our shortfall when it comes to critical minerals. I'm looking forward to getting up there. Representative Wool, you had a question. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. President. Um, thank you, Senator. Uh, for coming here and taking our questions. Always great to hear from the Alaska delegation. Um, you partially answered my question already at the end of your speech. Um, and as a parent of two young girls, and like yourself, when the Columbine shooting happened, I was here when the shooting in Parkland happened, and I have two girls in public school in Fairbanks. Um, and you asked the question of, of what to do, and we all ask ourselves that question besides lowering the flag and raising it again later. Um, and I, <clears throat> as you can tell from my voice, I've been a little sick, and I was in the pharmacy recently, and I got some sinus medicine, and I had to show my license and sign a document. Or if I got an opioid, they would enter my name and the doctor and the pharmacist into a database. And we all remember the Tylenol epidemic when a uh, mentally ill individual put poison in Tylenol bottles, and now we have childproof caps. So um, I think you answered the question, but it is now our childproof cap moment for gun violence and gun shootings? And if so, what do, what do you suggest? And I know this country does not have a monopoly on mental illness, but we do seem to have a monopoly on these mass shootings. So what do you tell a parent like myself who, to calm my fears 
And what do you tell a parent like myself that doesn't necessarily want to turn schools, which should be for learning, into war zones? Mm -hmm. Thank you. No, it's a, it's a very thoughtful and, and clearly a question that, that comes from the heart. And believe me, I, have, I, I, I wrestle with this every day. What is the right answer? And, and again, I'll repeat what I, I, I said in my statement, that there is no one answer. We have to address the, uh, the issue of mental illness and, and how, we can, how we can respond to the signals, uh, how, we can be, uh, how we can be a better, uh, a better support for those who uh, not only are clearly ill, um, but in many cases, are sending the signals that they're asking for help here. How do we come to, to knit that all together? And there are some, I think, some promising things that, uh, that we are, are coming to see. After the Columbine uh, tragedy, there was legislation that was put in place, and it was, it was called the Stop Violence Act, and it focused on basically securing our schools, putting more cameras in, uh, locks, um, lights. Uh, it was, it was, uh, you know, metal detectors at the doors. I'm with you. I, I don't want our schools to be a, a a place where you feel like you are in, in on the verge of a lockdown at at any moment's notice. Uh, uh, I don't want it to be that way. But I also want to make sure that our kids are safe. The, the reality, though, is that a focus like that is reactive. What are we doing to be proactive? And, and this is where I think we've got some momentum. Um, after Sandy Hook, uh, the parents, uh, many of the parents there who, who lost their children or who were Im clearly impacted by that tragedy came together with, with what they call Sandy Hook Promise. And, and it has really been focused on, on how we build the awareness, the assessment, and then the training uh, to, to, to pick up some of these, these signals. So if, if you're a kid and, and a classmate that you, you see all the time is just, things are not right, something is off. Where do you go? What do you do? Well, you know, you're a kid. You probably don't do anything. But giving them a safe place to, to report anonymously, whether it's through an app, giving them an, having the, the, uh, the, the network to, to, to take what is coming in to provide for a better assessment, these are some of the tools that we need to be looking to. And we've got a, we've got a bill that we're uh, dropping this next week I'm, uh, that focuses on some of the training uh, part of it to again be more proactive. I was in Eagle River at the high school there day before yesterday, and I asked the student government class that was there, freshmen through through seniors. I said, "I'm going to go back to to work in Washington on on Monday, and people are going to say, what are you going to do to fix things?'" I said, "Where would you start?" And it was interesting. Young woman raises her hand immediately, and starts speaking about the focus on assessment and training, and how in their school they, they have worked to help identify and then know where that safe place is to take that information to. I went from that meeting to